Section 10 of Orlando, A Biography by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6, Part 1 Orlando went indoors. It was completely still. It was very silent. There was the ink pot. There was the pen. There was the manuscript of her poem broken off in the middle of a tribute to eternity. She had been about to say, when Basket and Bartholomew interrupted with the tea things, nothing changes. And then, in the space of three seconds and a half, everything had changed. She had broken her ankle, fallen in love, married Shelmerdine. There was the wedding ring on her finger to prove it. It was true that she had put it there herself before she met Shelmerdine, but that had proved worse than useless. She now turned the ring round and round with superstitious reverence, taking care that it should not slip past the finger joint. The wedding ring has to be put on the second finger of the left hand, she said, like a child cautiously repeating its lesson, for it to be of any use at all. She spoke thus, aloud and rather more pompously than was her wont, as if she wished someone whose good opinion she desired to overhear her. Indeed, she had in mind, now that she was at last able to collect her thoughts, the effect that her behavior would have had upon the spirit of the age. She was extremely anxious to be informed whether the steps she had taken in the matter of getting engaged to Shelmerdine and marrying him met with its approval. She was certainly feeling more herself. Her finger had not tingled once, or nothing to count, since that night on the moor. Yet she could not deny that she had her doubts. She was married, true. But if one's husband was always sailing round Cape Horn, was it marriage? If one liked him, was it marriage? If one liked other people, was it marriage? And finally, if one still wished, more than anything in the whole world, to write poetry, was it marriage? She had her doubts. But she would put it to the test. She looked at the ring. She looked at the ink pot. Did she dare? No, she did not. But she must. No, she could not. What should she do then? Faint, if possible. But she had never felt better in her life. Hang it all, she cried, with a touch of her old spirit. Here goes. And she plunged her pen neck deep in the ink. To her enormous surprise, there was no explosion. She drew the nib out. It was wet, but not dripping. She wrote. The words were a little long in coming, but come they did. Ah, but did they make sense, she wondered, a panic coming over her, lest it might have been at some of its involuntary pranks again. She read. And then I came to a field where the springing grass was dulled by the hanging cups of fritillaries, sullen and foreign-looking, the snaky flower, scarfed in dull purple like Egyptian girls. At this point she felt that power—remember, we are dealing with the most obscure manifestations of the human spirit—which had been reading over her shoulder, tell her to stop. Grass, the power seemed to say, going back with a ruler such as governesses use to the beginning, is all right. The hanging cups of fritillaries? Admirable. The snaky flower? A thought strong from a lady's pen, perhaps, but Wordsworth, no doubt, sanctions it. But girls? Are girls necessary? You have a husband at the Cape, you say? Ah, well, that'll do. And so the spirit passed on. Orlando now performed, in spirit, for all this took place in spirit, a deep obeisance to the spirit of her age, such as, to compare great things with small, a traveller, 
conscious that he has a bundle of cigars in the corner of his suitcase, makes to the customs officer who has obligingly made a scribble of white chalk on the lid. For she was extremely doubtful whether, if the spirit had examined the contents of her mind carefully, it would not have found something highly contraband for which she would have had to pay the full fine. She had only escaped by the skin of her teeth. She had just managed, by some dexterous deference to the spirit of the age, by putting on a ring and finding a man on a moor, by loving nature and being no satirist, cynic, or psychologist, any one of which goods would have been discovered at once, to pass its examination successfully. And she heaved a deep sigh of relief, as indeed well she might, for the transaction between a writer and the spirit of the age is one of infinite delicacy, and upon a nice arrangement between the two, the whole fortune of his works depends. Orlando had so ordered it that she was in an extremely happy position. She need neither fight her age nor submit to it. She was of it, yet remained herself. Now, therefore, she could write. And write she did. She wrote. She wrote. She wrote. It was now November. After November comes December. Then January, February, March, and April. After April comes May. June, July, August follow. Next is September. Then October, and so, behold, here we are back at November again with a whole year accomplished. This method of writing biography, though it has its merits, is a little bare, perhaps. And the reader, if we go on with it, may complain that he could recite the calendar for himself, and so save his pocket whatever sum the publisher may think proper to charge for this book. But what can the biographer do when his subject has put him in the predicament in which Orlando has now put us? Life, it has been agreed by everyone whose opinion is worth consulting, is the only fit subject for novelist or biographer. Life, the same authorities have decided, has nothing whatever to do with sitting still in a chair and thinking. Thought and life are as the poles asunder. Therefore, since sitting in a chair and thinking is precisely what Orlando is doing now, there is nothing for it but to recite the calendar, tell one's beads, blow one's nose, stir the fire, look out of the window, until she has done. Orlando sat so still that you could have heard a pin drop. Would indeed that a pin had dropped. That would have been life, of a kind. Or if a butterfly had fluttered through the window and settled on her chair, one could write about that. Or suppose she had got up and killed a wasp. Then, at once, we could out with our pens and write, for there would be blood shed, if only the blood of a wasp. And if killing a wasp is the merest trifle compared with killing a man, still it is a fitter subject for novelist or biographer than this mere wool-gathering, this thinking, this sitting in a chair day in, day out, with a cigarette and a sheet of paper and a pen and an ink-pot. If only subjects, we might complain, for our patience is wearing thin, had more consideration for their biographers— what is more irritating than to see one subject on whom one has lavished so much time and trouble slipping out of one's grasp altogether and indulging witness her sighs and gasps her flushing her palings her eyes now bright as lamps now haggard as dawns what is more humiliating than to see all this dumb show of emotion and excitement gone through before our eyes when we know that what causes it, thought and imagination, are of no importance whatsoever. But Orlando was a woman. Lord Palmerston had just proved it. And when we are writing the life of a woman, we may, it is agreed, waive our demand for action and substitute love instead. Love, the poet has said, is woman's whole existence. And if we look for a moment— 
at Orlando writing at her table, we must admit that never was there a woman more fitted for that calling. Surely, since she is a woman, and a beautiful woman, and a woman in the prime of life, she will soon give over this pretense of writing and thinking, and begin to think, at least, of a gamekeeper. And as long as she thinks of a man, nobody objects to a woman thinking. And then she will write him a little note. As long as she writes little notes, nobody objects to a woman writing, either. And make an assignation for Sunday dusk. And Sunday dusk will come, and the gamekeeper will whistle under the window, all of which is, of course, the very stuff of life, and the only possible subject for fiction. Surely Orlando must have done one of these things. Alas, a thousand times, alas, Orlando did none of them. Must it then be admitted that Orlando was one of those monsters of iniquity who do not love? She was kind to dogs, faithful to friends, generosity itself to a dozen starving poets, had a passion for poetry. But love, as the male novelists define it, and who, after all, speak with greater authority, has nothing whatever to do with kindness, fidelity, generosity, or poetry. Love is slipping off one's petticoat and— But we all know what love is. Did Orlando do that? Truth compels us to say no, she did not. If, then, the subject of one's biography will neither love nor kill, but will only think and imagine, we may conclude that he or she is no better than a corpse, and so leave her. The only resource now left us is to look out of the window. There were sparrows, there were starlings, there were a number of doves, and one or two rooks, all occupied after their fashion. One finds a worm, another a snail. One flutters to a branch, another takes a little run on the turf. Then a servant crosses the courtyard wearing a green baize apron. Presumably he is engaged on some intrigue with one of the maids in the pantry, but as no visible proof is offered us in the courtyard, we can but hope for the best and leave it. Clouds pass, thin or thick, with some disturbance of the color of the grass beneath. The sundial registers the hour in its usual cryptic way. One's mind begins tossing up a question or two, idly, vainly, about this same life. Life, it sings, or croons, rather, like a kettle on a hob. Life, life, what art thou? Light or darkness? The bay's apron of the underfootman, or the shadow of the starling on the grass? Let us go, then, exploring this summer morning, when all are adoring the plum blossom and the bee. And humming and hawing, let us ask of the starling, who is a more sociable bird than the lark, what he may think on the brink of the dustbin, whence he picks among the sticks combings of scullion's hair. What's life, we ask, leaning on the farmyard gate? Life, 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 cries the bird, as if he had heard, and knew precisely, what we meant by this bothering, prying habit of ours, of asking questions indoors and out, and peeping and picking at daisies, as the way is of writers when they don't know what to say next. Then they come here, says the bird, and ask me what life is. Life, life, life. We trudge on, then, by the moor path, to the high brow of the wine-blue purple dark hill, and fling ourselves down there, and dream there, and see there a grasshopper carting back to his home in the hollow a straw. And he says, if sawings like his can be given a name so sacred and tender, life's labor, or so we interpret the whir of his dust-choked gullet. And the ant agrees, and the bees— but if we lie here long enough to ask the moths, when they come at evening, stealing among the paler heather bells, they will breathe in our ears such wild nonsense as one hears from telegraph wires in snowstorms. Tee-hee, ha-ha, laughter, laughter, the moths say. Having asked then of man and of bird and the insects, 
For fish, men tell us, who have lived in green caves, solitary for years, to hear them speak, never, never say, and so perhaps know what life is. Having asked them all, and grown no wiser, but only older and colder, for did we not pray once in a way to wrap up in a book something so hard, so rare, one could swear it was life's meaning? Back we must go and say straight out to the reader, who waits a tiptoe to hear what life is. Alas, we don't know. At this moment, but only just in time to save the book from extinction, Orlando pushed away her chair, stretched her arms, dropped her pen, came to the window, and exclaimed, Done! She was almost felled to the ground by the extraordinary sight which now met her eyes. There was the garden, and some birds. The world was going on as usual. All the time she was writing, the world had continued. "'And if I were dead, it would be just the same!' she exclaimed. Such was the intensity of her feelings, that she could even imagine that she had suffered dissolution, and perhaps some faintness actually attacked her. For a moment she stood looking at the fair, indifferent spectacle, with staring eyes. At length she was revived in a singular way. The manuscript which reposed above her heart began shuffling and beating as if it were a living thing, and, what was still odder, and showed how fine a sympathy was between them, Orlando, by inclining her head, could make out what it was that it was saying. It wanted to be read. It must be read. It would die in her bosom if it were not read. For the first time in her life she turned with violence against nature. Elk hounds and rose bushes were about her in profusion. But elk hounds and rose bushes can none of them read. It is a lamentable oversight on the part of Providence, which had never struck her before. Human beings alone have this power. Human beings had become necessary. She rang the bell. She ordered the carriage to take her to London at once. "'There's just time to catch the 11.45, my lady,' said Basket. Orlando had not yet realized the invention of the steam engine. But such was her absorption in the sufferings of a being who, though not herself, yet entirely depended on her, that she saw a railway train for the first time, took her seat in a railway carriage, and had the rug arranged about her knees without giving a thought to that stupendous invention which had, the historians say, completely changed the face of Europe in the past twenty years, as indeed happens much more frequently than historians suppose. She noticed only that it was extremely smutty, rattled horribly, and the windows stuck. Lost in thought, she was whirled up to London in something less than an hour, and stood on the platform at Charing Cross, not knowing where to go. The old house at Blackfriars, where she had spent so many pleasant days in the eighteenth century, was now sold, part to the Salvation Army, part to an umbrella factory. She had bought another in Mayfair, which was sanitary, convenient, and in the heart of the fashionable world. But was it in Mayfair that her poem would be relieved of its desire? Pray God, she thought, remembering the brightness of their ladyship's eyes and the symmetry of their lordship's legs. They haven't taken to reading there. For that would be a thousand pities. Then there was Lady R.'s. The same sort of talk would be going on there still, she had no doubt. The gout might have shifted from the general's left leg to his right, perhaps. Mr. L. might have stayed ten days with R. instead of T. Then Mr. Pope would come in. Oh, but Mr. Pope was dead. Who were the wits now, she wondered. But that was not a question one could put to a porter, and so she moved on. 
her ears were now distracted by the jingling of innumerable bells on the heads of innumerable horses. Fleets of the strangest little boxes on wheels were drawn up by the pavement. She walked out into the strand. There, the uproar was even worse. Vehicles of all sizes, drawn by blood horses and by dray horses, conveying one solitary dowager, or crowded to the top by whiskered men in silk hats, were inextricably mixed. Carriages, carts, and omnibuses seemed, to her eyes, so long used to the look of a plain sheet of fool's cap, alarmingly at loggerheads, and to her ears, attuned to a pen scratching, the uproar of the street sounded violently and hideously cacophonous. Every inch of the pavement was crowded, streams of people threading in and out between their own bodies and the lurching and lumbering traffic with incredible agility, poured incessantly east and west. Along the edge of the pavement stood men holding out trays of toys and bawled, at corners, women sat beside great baskets of spring flowers and bawled. Boys, running in and out of the horses' noses, holding printed sheets to their bodies, bawled too. Disaster! Disaster! At first, Orlando supposed that she had arrived at some moment of national crisis, but whether it was happy or tragic she could not tell. She looked anxiously at people's faces but that confused her still more. Here would come by a man sunk in despair, muttering to himself as if he knew some terrible sorrow. Past him would nudge a fat, jolly-faced fellow, shouldering his way along as if it were a festival for all the world. Indeed, she came to the conclusion that there was neither rhyme nor reason in any of it. Each man and each woman was bent on his own affairs. And where was she to go? She walked on without thinking, up one street and down another, by vast windows piled with handbags and mirrors and dressing gowns and flowers and fishing rods and luncheon baskets, while stuff of every hue and pattern, thickness or thinness, was looped and festooned and ballooned across and across. Sometimes she passed down avenues of sedate mansions, soberly numbered one, two, three, and so on, right up to two or three hundred, each the copy of the other, with two pillars and six steps, and a pair of curtains neatly drawn, and family luncheons laid on tables, and a parrot looking out of one window, and a manservant out of another, until her mind was dizzied with the monotony. Then she came to great open squares, with black, shiny, tightly buttoned statues of fat men in the middle, and war-horses prancing, and columns rising, and fountains falling, and pigeons fluttering. So she walked and walked along pavements between houses until she felt very hungry, and something fluttering above her heart rebuked her with having forgotten all about it. It was her manuscript the oak tree. She was confounded at her own neglect. She stopped dead where she stood. No coach was in sight. The street, which was wide and handsome, was singularly empty. Only one elderly gentleman was approaching. There was something vaguely familiar to her in his walk. As he came nearer, she felt certain that she had met him at some time or other before. But when? But where? Could it be that this gentleman, so neat, so portly, so prosperous, with a cane in his hand and a flower in his buttonhole, with a pink plump face and combed white mustaches, could it be, yes, by Jove it was, her old, her very old friend, Nick Green. At the same time, he looked at her, remembered her, recognized her. The Lady Orlando, he cried, sweeping his silk hat almost in the dust. Sir Nicholas, she replied, for she was made aware intuitively by something in his bearing 
that the scurrilous penny a liner who had lampooned her and many another in the time of Queen Elizabeth, was now risen in the world and become certainly a knight and doubtless a dozen other fine things into the bargain. With another bow he acknowledged that her conclusion was correct. He was a knight. He was a lit D. He was a professor. He was the author of a score of volumes. He was, in short, the most influential critic of the Victorian age. A violent tumult of emotion besieged her at meeting the man who had caused her years ago so much pain. Could this be the plaguy, restless fellow who had burned holes in her carpets and toasted cheese in the Italian fireplace and told such merry stories of Marlowe and the rest that they had seen the sun rise nine nights out of ten? He was now sprucely dressed in a gray morning suit, had a pink flower in his buttonhole, and gray suede gloves to match. But even as she marveled, he made another profound bow and asked her whether she would honor him by lunching with him. The bow was a thought overdone, perhaps, but the imitation of fine breeding was creditable. She followed him wandering into a superb restaurant, all red plush, white tablecloths, and silver cruets, as unlike as could be the old tavern or coffee-house with its sanded floor, its wooden benches, its bowls of punch and chocolate, and its broad sheets and spittoons. He laid his gloves neatly on the table beside him. Still she could hardly believe that he was the same man. His nails were clean where they used to be an inch long. His chin was shaved where a black beard used to sprout. He wore gold sleeve links where his ragged linen used to dip in the broth. It was not, indeed, until he had ordered the wine, which he did with a care that reminded her of his taste in Malmsey long ago, that she was convinced he was the same man. Ah, he said, heaving a little sigh, which was yet comfortable enough. Ah, my dear lady, the great days of literature are over. Marlowe, Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, those were the giants. Dryden, Pope, Addison, those were the heroes. Oh, all are dead now. On whom have they left us? Tennyson, Browning, Carlyle. He threw an immense amount of scorn into his voice. The truth of it is, he said, pouring himself a glass of wine, that all our young writers are in the pay of booksellers. They turn out any trash that serves to pay their tailor's bills. It is an age, he said, helping himself to hors d'oeuvres, marked by precious conceits and wild experiments none of which the Elizabethans would have tolerated for an instant. "'No, my dear lady,' he continued, passing with approval the turbot au gratin, which the waiter exhibited for his sanction. "'The great days are over. We live in degenerate times. We must cherish the past. Honour those writers, there are still a few left of them, who take antiquity for their model and write— not for pay, but... Here, Orlando almost shouted, Glar! Indeed, she could have sworn that she had heard him say the very same things three hundred years ago. The names were different, of course, but the spirit was the same. Nick Green had not changed for all his knighthood, and yet some change there was. For while he ran on about taking Addison as one's model... It had been Cicero once, she thought, and lying in bed of a morning, which she was proud to think her pension, paid quarterly, enabled him to do, rolling the best works of the best authors round and round on one's tongue for an hour at least before setting pen to paper, so that the vulgarity of the present time and the deplorable condition of our native tongue, he had lived long in America, she believed, might be purified while he ran on in much the same way that Green had run on three hundred years ago, she had time to ask herself, 
How was it, then, that he had changed? He had grown plump, but he was a man verging on seventy. He had grown sleek. Literature had been a prosperous pursuit, evidently. But somehow the old, restless, uneasy vivacity had gone. His stories, brilliant as they were, were no longer quite so free and easy. He mentioned, it is true, my dear friend Pope, or my illustrious friend Addison, every other second. But he had an air of respectability about him which was depressing, and he preferred, it seemed, to enlighten her about the doings and sayings of her own blood relations, rather than tell her, as he used to do, scandal about the poets. Orlando was unaccountably disappointed. She had thought of literature all these years. Her seclusion, her rank, her sex must be her excuse. As something wild as the wind, hot as fire, swift as lightning. Something errant, incalculable, abrupt. And behold, literature was an elderly gentleman in a grey suit talking about duchesses. The violence of her disillusionment was such that some hook or button fastening the upper part of her dress burst open, and out upon the table fell the oak tree, a poem. "'A manuscript,' said Sir Nicholas, putting on his gold pince-nez. "'How interesting! How excessively interesting! Permit me to look at it.' And once more... After an interval of some three hundred years, Nicholas Green took Orlando's poem, and, laying it down among the coffee cups and the liquor glasses, began to read it. But now his verdict was very different from what it had been then. It reminded him, he said as he turned over the pages, of Addison's Cato. It compared favorably with Thompson's Seasons. There was no trace in it, he was thankful to say, of the modern spirit. It was composed with a regard to truth, to nature, to the dictates of the human heart, which was rare indeed in these days of unscrupulous eccentricity. It must, of course, be published instantly. Really, Orlando did not know what he meant. She had always carried her manuscripts about with her in the bosom of her dress. The idea tickled Sir Nicholas considerably. "'But what about royalties?' he asked. Orlando's mind flew to Buckingham Palace and some dusky potentates who happened to be staying there. Sir Nicholas was highly diverted. He explained that he was alluding to the fact that Messrs. Blank, here he mentioned a well-known firm of publishers, would be delighted— if he wrote them a line, to put the book on their list. He could probably arrange for a royalty of ten percent on all copies up to two thousand. After that it would be fifteen. As for the reviewers, he would himself write a line to Mr. Blank, who was the most influential, then a compliment, say, a little puff of her own poems, addressed to the wife of the editor of the Blank, never did any harm. He would call Blank. So he ran on. Orlando understood nothing of all this, and from old experience did not altogether trust his good nature, but there was nothing for it but to submit to what was evidently his wish and the fervent desire of the poem itself. So Sir Nicholas made the blood-stained packet into a neat parcel, flattened it into his breast pocket lest it should disturb the set of his coat, and, with many compliments on both sides, they parted. Orlando walked up the street. Now that the poem was gone, and she felt a bare place in her breast where she had been used to carry it, she had nothing to do but reflect upon whatever she liked, the extraordinary chances it might be of the human lot. Here she was, in St. James's Street, a married woman, with a ring on her finger. Where there had been a coffee-house once, there was now a restaurant. It was about half-past three in the afternoon. The sun was shining. There were three pigeons, a mongrel terrier dog, 
two handsome cabs, and a barouche landau. What, then, was life? The thought popped into her head violently, irrelevantly, unless old Green were somehow the cause of it. And it may be taken as a comment, adverse or favorable as the reader chooses to consider it, upon her relations with her husband, who was at the horn, that whenever anything popped violently into her head, she went straight to the nearest telegraph office and wired to him. There was one, as it happened, close at hand. "'My God, Shell,' she wired, "'life, literature, green, toady.' Here she dropped into a cipher language which they had invented between them, so that a whole spiritual state of the utmost complexity might be conveyed in a word or two without the telegraph clerk being any the wiser, and added the words, "'Ratigan glumfaboo,' which summed it up precisely." For not only had the events of the morning made a deep impression on her, but it cannot have escaped the reader's attention that Orlando was growing up, which is not necessarily growing better. And Ratigan Glumfabu described a very complicated spiritual state, which, if the reader puts all his intelligence at our service, he may discover for himself. There could be no answer to her telegram for some hours. Indeed, it was probable, she thought, glancing at the sky, where the upper clouds raced swiftly past, that there was a gale at Cape Horn, so that her husband would be at the masthead as likely as not, or cutting away some tattered spar, or even alone in a boat with a biscuit. And so, leaving the post office, she turned to beguile herself into the next shop which was a shop so common in our day that it needs no description, yet to her eyes strange in the extreme, a shop where they sold books. All her life long Orlando had known manuscripts, had held in her hands the rough brown sheets on which Spencer had written in his little crabbed hand. She had seen Shakespeare's script and Milton's. She owned, indeed, a fair number of quartos and folios, often with a sonnet in her praise in them, and sometimes a lock of hair. But these innumerable little volumes, bright, identical, ephemeral, for they seemed bound in cardboard and printed on tissue paper, surprised her infinitely. The whole works of Shakespeare cost half a crown and could be put in your pocket. One could hardly read them, indeed, the print was so small, but it was a marvel nonetheless. Works, the works of every writer she had known or heard of, and many more, stretched from end to end of the long shelves. On tables and chairs more works were piled and tumbled. And these she saw, turning a page or two, were often works about other works, by Sir Nicholas, and a score of others whom, in her ignorance, she supposed, since they were bound and printed, to be very great writers, too. So she gave an astounding order to the bookseller to send her everything of any importance in the shop, and left. She turned into Hyde Park, which she had known of old, Beneath that cleft tree, she remembered, the Duke of Hamilton fell, run through the body by Lord Mohun. And her lips, which are often to blame in the matter, began framing the words of her telegram into a senseless sing-song. Life, literature, green, toady, radigan, glumfaboo. So that several park-keepers looked at her with suspicion, and were only brought to a favorable opinion of her sanity, by noticing the pearl necklace which she wore. She had carried off a sheaf of papers and critical journals from the bookshop, and at length, flinging herself on her elbow beneath a tree, she spread these pages round her and did her best to fathom the noble art of prose composition as these masters practiced it. For still the old credulity was alive in her, even the blurred type of a weekly newspaper had some sanctity in her eyes. So she read, lying on her elbow, an article by Sir Nicholas on the collected works of a man she had once known, John Donne. 
but she had pitched herself without knowing it, not far from the serpentine. The barking of a thousand dogs sounded in her ears. Carriage wheels rushed ceaselessly in a circle round her. Leaves sighed overhead. Now and again a braided skirt and a pair of tight scarlet trousers crossed the grass within a few steps of her. Once a gigantic rubber ball bounced on the newspaper. Violets, oranges, reds, and blues broke through the interstices of the leaves and sparkled in the emerald on her finger. She was distracted between the two. She looked at the paper and looked up. She looked at the sky and looked down. Life? Literature? One to be made into the other? But how monstrously difficult! For here came by a pair of tight scarlet trousers. How would Addison have put that? Here came two dogs dancing on their hind legs. How would Lamb have described that? For reading Sir Nicholas and his friends, as she did in the intervals of looking about her, she somehow got the impression, here she rose and walked, they made one feel, it was an extremely uncomfortable feeling, one must never, never say what one thought. She stood on the banks of the serpentine. It was a bronze color. Spider-thin boats were skimming from side to side. They made one feel, she continued, that one must always always write like somebody else. The tears formed themselves in her eyes. For really, she thought, pushing a little boat off with her toe, I don't think I could. Here the whole of Sir Nicholas's article came before her, as articles do, ten minutes after they are read, with the look of his room, his head, his cat, his writing table, and the time of day thrown in. I don't think I could, she continued, considering the article from this point of view. Sit in a study? No, it's not a study. It's a moldy kind of drawing room, all day long, and talk to pretty young men, and tell them little anecdotes, which they mustn't repeat, about what Tupper said about smiles, and then, she continued, weeping bitterly, they're all so manly, and then, I do detest duchesses, and I don't like cake, and though I'm spiteful enough, I could never learn to be as spiteful as all that, so how can I be a critic and write the best English prose of my time? Damn it all! she exclaimed, launching a penny steamer so vigorously that the poor little boat almost sank in the bronze-colored waves. Now the truth is that when one has been in a state of mind, as nurses call it, and the tears still stood in Orlando's eyes, the thing one is looking at becomes not itself but another thing, which is bigger and much more important, and yet remains the same thing. If one looks at the serpentine in this state of mind, the waves soon become just as big as the waves on the Atlantic. The toy boats become indistinguishable from ocean liners. So Orlando mistook the toy boat for her husband's brig, and the wave she had made with her toe for a mountain of water off Cape Horn. And as she watched the toy boat climb the ripple, she thought she saw Bonthrop's ship climb up and up a glassy wall. Up and up it went, and a white crest with a thousand deaths in it arched over it. And through the thousand deaths it went and disappeared. It's sunk, she cried out in agony. And then, behold, there it was again, sailing along safe and sound among the ducks on the other side of the Atlantic. Ecstasy, she cried. Ecstasy! Where's the post office? she wondered for I must wire at once to Shell and tell him. And repeating, a toy boat on the serpentine, and ecstasy, alternately, for the thoughts were interchangeable, and meant exactly the same thing. She hurried towards Park Lane. A toy boat, a toy boat, a toy boat, she repeated, thus enforcing upon herself the fact that it is not articles by Nick Green on John Donne, nor eight-hour bills, nor covenants, nor factory acts that matter. 
It's something useless, sudden, violent, something that costs a life. Red, blue, purple, a spurt, a splash, like those hyacinths, she was passing a fine bed of them, free from taint, dependence, soilure of humanity, or care for one's kind, something rash, ridiculous, like my hyacinth, husband, I mean, Bonthrop, that's what it is, a toy boat on the serpentine, it's ecstasy, ecstasy. Thus she spoke aloud, waiting for the carriages to pass at Stanhope Gate, for the consequence of not living with one's husband, except when the wind is sunk, is that one talks nonsense aloud in Park Lane. It would no doubt have been different had she lived all the year round with him, as Queen Victoria recommended. As it was, the thought of him would come upon her in a flash. She found it absolutely necessary to speak to him instantly. She did not care in the least what nonsense it might make or what dislocation it might inflict on the narrative. Nick Green's article had plunged her in the depths of despair. The toy boat had raised her to the heights of joy. So she repeated, Ecstasy! Ecstasy! as she stood waiting to cross. But the traffic was heavy that spring afternoon, and kept her standing there, repeating Ecstasy! Ecstasy! or A Toy Boat on the Serpentine, while the wealth and power of England sat as if sculptured in hat and cloak, in four in hand, Victoria and Baruch Landau. It was as if a golden river had coagulated and massed itself in golden blocks across Park Lane. The ladies held card cases between their fingers. The gentlemen balanced gold-mounted canes between their knees. She stood there gazing, admiring, awestruck, one thought only disturbed her, a thought familiar to all who behold great elephants, or whales of an incredible magnitude, and that is, how do these leviathans, to whom obviously stress, change, and activity are repugnant, propagate their kind? Perhaps, Orlando thought, looking at the stately, still faces, their time of propagation is over, this is the fruit. This is the consummation. What she now beheld was the triumph of an age. Portly and splendid, there they sat. But now the policeman let fall his hand. The stream became liquid. The massive conglomeration of splendid objects moved, dispersed, and disappeared into Piccadilly. So she crossed Park Lane, and went to her house in Curzon Street, where, when the meadow sweet blew there, she could remember Curlew calling, and one very old man with a gun. She could remember, she thought, stepping across the threshold of her house, how Lord Chesterfield had said, but her memory was checked. Her discreet eighteenth-century hall, where she could see Lord Chesterfield putting his hat down here and his coat down there with an elegance of deportment which it was a pleasure to watch, was now completely littered with parcels. While she had been sitting in Hyde Park, the bookseller had delivered her order, and the house was crammed. There were parcels slipping down the staircase. With the whole of Victorian literature done up in grey paper, and neatly tied with string. She carried as many of these packets as she could to her room, ordered footmen to bring the others, and, rapidly cutting innumerable strings, was soon surrounded by innumerable volumes. Accustomed to the little literatures of the sixteenth, seventeenth, and eighteenth centuries, Orlando was appalled by the consequences of her order. For, of course, to the Victorians themselves, Victorian literature meant not merely four great names separate and distinct, but four great names sunk and embedded in a mass of Alexander Smiths, Dixons, Blacks, Millmans, Buckles, Taines, Paines, Tuppers, Jamesons, all vocal, clamorous, prominent, and requiring as much attention as anybody else. Orlando's reverence for print had a tough job set before it. 
but drawing her chair to the window to get the benefit of what light might filter between the high houses of Mayfair, she tried to come to a conclusion. And now it is clear that there are only two ways of coming to a conclusion upon Victorian literature. One is to write it out in sixty volumes octavo. The other is to squeeze it into six lines of the length of this one. Of the two courses, economy, since time runs short, leads us to choose the second, and so we proceed. Orlando then came to the conclusion, opening half a dozen books, that it was very odd that there was not a single dedication to a nobleman among them. Next, turning over a vast pile of memoirs, that several of these writers had family trees half as high as her own. Next, that it would be impolitic in the extreme to wrap a ten-pound note round the sugar-tongs when Miss Christina Rossetti came to tea. Next, here were half a dozen invitations to celebrate centenaries by dining. That literature, since it ate all these dinners, must be growing very corpulent. Next, she was invited to a score of lectures upon the influence of this upon that, the classic revival, the romantic survival, and other titles of the same engaging kind. That literature, since it listened to all these lectures, must be growing very dry. Next, here she attended a reception given by a peeress, that literature, since it wore all these fur tippets, must be growing very respectable. Next, here she visited Carlyle's soundproof room at Chelsea, that genius, since it needed all this coddling, must be growing very delicate. And so at last she reached her final conclusion, which was of the highest importance, but which, as we have already much overpassed our limit of six lines, we must omit. Orlando, having come to this conclusion, stood looking out of the window for a considerable space of time. For when anybody comes to a conclusion, it is as if they had tossed the ball over the net, and must wait for the unseen antagonist to return it to them. What would be sent her next from the colorless sky above Chesterfield House, she wondered. And with her hands clasped, she stood for a considerable space of time, wondering. Suddenly she started, and here we could only wish that, as on a former occasion, purity, chastity, and modesty would push the door ajar and provide at least a breathing space in which we could think how to wrap up what now has to be told delicately, as a biographer should. But no, having thrown their white garment at the naked Orlando and seen it fall short by several inches, these ladies had given up all intercourse with her these many years and were now otherwise engaged. Is nothing, then, going to happen this pale March morning, to mitigate, to veil, to cover, to conceal, to shroud this undeniable event, whatever it may be? For after giving that sudden, violent start, Orlando, but heaven be praised, at this very moment, there struck up outside one of these frail, reedy, fluty, jerky, old-fashioned barrel organs— which are still sometimes played by Italian organ grinders in back streets. Let us accept the intervention, humble though it is, as if it were the music of the spheres, and allow it, with all its gasps and groans, to fill this page with sound until the moment comes which it is impossible to deny is coming, which the footman has seen coming and the maidservant, and the reader will have to see too, for Orlando herself is clearly unable to ignore it any longer. Let the barrel organ sound and transport us on thought, which is no more than a little boat, when music sounds, tossing on the waves. On thought, which is, of all carriers, the most clumsy, the most erratic, over the rooftops and the back gardens, where washing is hanging to— What is this place? Do you recognize the green, and in the middle the steeple, and the gates with a lion couchant on either side? Oh, yes, it is Q. Well— Q will do. So here, then, we are at Q, and I will show you today, the 2nd of March, under the plum tree, 
a grape hyacinth, and a crocus, and a bud, too, on the almond tree. So that to walk there is to be thinking of bulbs, hairy and red, thrust into the earth in October, flowering now, and to be dreaming of more than can rightly be said, and to be taking from its case a cigarette, or cigar even, and to be flinging a cloak under, as the rhyme requires, an oak, and there to sit waiting the kingfisher, which, it is said, was seen once to cross in the evening from bank to bank. Wait, wait, the kingfisher comes. The kingfisher comes not. Behold, meanwhile, the factory chimneys and their smoke. Behold the city clerks flashing by in their outrigger. Behold the old lady taking her dog for a walk and the servant girl wearing her new hat for the first time, not at the right angle. Behold them all. Though heaven has mercifully decreed that the secrets of all hearts are hidden, so that we are lured on forever to suspect something, perhaps, that does not exist, still through our cigarette smoke we see blaze up and salute the splendid fulfillment of natural desires for a hat, for a boat, for a rat in a ditch, as once one saw blazing, such silly hops and skips the mind takes when it slops like this all over the saucer and the barrel organ plays, saw blazing a fire in a field against the minarets near Constantinople. Hail, natural desire! Hail, happiness, divine happiness, and pleasure of all sorts, flowers and wine, though one fades and the other intoxicates and half-crown tickets out of London on Sundays, and singing in a dark chapel hymns about death, and anything, anything that interrupts and confounds the tapping of typewriters, and filing of letters, and forging of links and chains binding the empire together. Hail even the crude red bows on shop-girl's lips, as if Cupid very clumsily dipped his thumb in red ink and scrawled a token in passing. Hail, happiness, kingfisher flashing from bank to bank, and all fulfillment of natural desire, whether it is what the male novelist says it is, or prayer, or denial, hail, in whatever form it comes, and may there be more forms and stranger. For dark flows the stream, would it were true, as the rhyme hints, like a dream, but duller and worser than that is our usual lot without dreams, but alive, smug, fluent, habitual, under trees whose shade of an olive green drowns the blue of the wing of the vanishing bird when he darts of a sudden from bank to bank. Hail happiness, then, and after happiness, hail not those dreams which blow to the sharp image as spotted mirrors do the face in a country inn parlor, Dreams which splinter the whole and tear us asunder and wound us and split us apart in the night when we would sleep, but sleep, sleep, so deep that all shapes are ground to dust of infinite softness, water of dimness inscrutable, and there, folded, shrouded like a mummy, like a moth, prone let us lie on the sand at the bottom of sleep. But wait, but wait! We are not going this time, visiting the blind land. Blue, like a match struck right in the ball of the innermost eye, he flies, burns, bursts the seal of sleep, the kingfisher, so that now floods back, refluent like a tide, the red, thick stream of life again, bubbling, dripping. And we rise, and our eyes, for how handy a rhyme is to pass us safe over the awkward transition from death to life, fall on. Here the barrel organ stops playing abruptly. It's a very fine boy, milady," said Mrs. Banting, the midwife. In other words, Orlando was safely delivered of a son on Thursday, March the 20th, at three o'clock in the morning. End of section 10. Section 11 of Orlando, a Biography by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 
Part Two Once more Orlando stood at the window, but let the reader take courage. Nothing of the same sort is going to happen today, which is not, by any means, the same day. No, for if we look out of the window, as Orlando was doing at the moment, we shall see that Park Lane itself has considerably changed. Indeed, one might stand there ten minutes or more, as Orlando stood now, without seeing a single Baruch Landau. "'Look at that!' she exclaimed, some days later, when an absurd truncated carriage without any horses began to glide about of its own accord. "'A carriage without any horses, indeed!' She was called away just as she said that, but came back again after a time, and had another look out of the window. It was odd sort of weather nowadays. The sky itself, she could not help thinking, had changed. It was no longer so thick, so watery, so prismatic, now that King Edward, see, there he was, stepping out of his neat brougham to go and visit a certain lady opposite, had succeeded Queen Victoria. The clouds had shrunk to a thin gauze, the sky seemed made of metal, which in hot weather tarnished verdigris, copper color, or orange, as metal does in a fog. It was a little alarming, this shrinkage. Everything seemed to have shrunk. Driving past Buckingham Palace last night, there was not a trace of that vast erection which she had thought everlasting. Top hats, widow's weeds, trumpets, telescopes, wreaths, all had vanished and left not a stain, not a puddle even, on the pavement. But it was now, after another interval she had come back again to her favorite station in the window, now, in the evening, that the change was most remarkable. Look at the lights in the houses. At a touch a whole room was lit, hundreds of rooms were lit, and one was precisely the same as the other. One could see everything in the little square-shaped boxes. There was no privacy, none of those lingering shadows and odd corners that there used to be, none of those women in aprons carrying wobbly lamps which they put down carefully on this table and on that. At a touch the whole room was bright, and the sky was bright all night long, and the pavements were bright, everything was bright. She came back again at midday. How narrow women had grown lately. They looked like stalks of corn, straight, shining, identical. And men's faces were as bare as the palm of one's hand. The dryness of the atmosphere brought out the color in everything and seemed to stiffen the muscles of the cheeks. It was harder to cry now. People were much gayer. Water was hot in two seconds. Ivy had perished or been scraped off houses. Vegetables were less fertile. Families were much smaller. Curtains and covers had been frizzled up, and the walls were bare so that new, brilliantly colored pictures of real things like streets, umbrellas, apples, were hung in frames or painted upon the wood. There was something definite and distinct about the age which reminded her of the eighteenth century, except that there was a distraction, a desperation. As she was thinking this, the immensely long tunnel in which she seemed to have been traveling for hundreds of years widened, the light poured in, her thoughts became mysteriously tightened and strung up as if a piano tuner had put his key in her back and stretched the nerves very taut. At the same time, her hearing quickened. She could hear every whisper and crackle in the room, so that the clock ticking on the mantelpiece beat like a hammer. And so for some seconds the light went on becoming brighter and brighter, and she saw everything more and more clearly, and the clock ticked louder and louder, until there was a terrific explosion right in her ear. Orlando leapt as if she had been violently struck on the head. Ten times she was struck. 
In fact, it was ten o'clock in the morning. It was the eleventh of October. It was 1928. It was the present moment. No one need wonder that Orlando started, pressed her hand to her heart, and turned pale. For what more terrifying revelation can there be than that it is the present moment? That we survive the shock at all is only possible because the past shelters us on one side, the future on another. But we have no time now for reflections. Orlando was terribly late already. She ran downstairs, jumped into her motor car, pressed the self-starter, and was off. Vast blue blocks of building rose into the air. The red cowls of chimneys were spotted irregularly across the sky. The road shone like silver-headed nails. Omnibuses bore down upon her with sculptured white-faced drivers. She noticed sponges, bird cages, boxes of green American cloth. But she did not allow these sights to sink into her mind even the fraction of an inch as she crossed the narrow plank of the present, lest she should fall into the raging torrent beneath. Why don't you look where you're going to? Put your hand out, can't you? That was all she said, sharply, as if the words were jerked out of her, for the streets were immensely crowded. People crossed without looking where they were going. People buzzed and hummed round the plate-glass windows within which one could see a glow of red, a blaze of yellow, as if they were bees, Orlando thought. But her thought that they were bees was violently snipped off, and she saw, regaining perspective with one flick of her eye, that they were bodies. "'Why don't you look where you're going?' she snapped out. At last, however, she drew up at Marshall and Snellgrove's and went into the shop. Shade and scent enveloped her. The present fell from her like drops of scalding water. Light swayed up and down like thin stuffs puffed out by a summer breeze. She took a list from her bag and began reading in a curious, stiff voice at first, as if she were holding the words, boys, boots, bath salts, sardines, under a tap of many-colored water. She watched them change as the light fell on them. Bath and boots became blunt, obtuse. Sardines serrated itself like a saw. So she stood in the ground-floor department of Messrs. Marshall and Snellgrove, looked this way and that, snuffed this smell and that, and thus wasted some seconds. Then she got into the lift, for the good reason that the door stood open, and was shot smoothly upwards. The very fabric of life now, she thought as she rose, is magic. In the eighteenth century we knew how everything was done, but here I rise through the air. I listen to voices in America. I see men flying. But how it's done I can't even begin to wonder. So my belief in magic returns. Now the lift gave a little jerk as it stopped at the first floor, and she had a vision of innumerable colored stuffs flaunting in a breeze from which came distinct, strange smells. And each time the lift stopped and flung its doors open, there was another slice of the world displayed with all the smells of that world clinging to it. She was reminded of the river off Wapping in the time of Elizabeth, where the treasure ships and the merchant ships used to anchor, how richly and curiously they had smelt, how well she remembered the feel of rough rubies running through her fingers when she dabbed them in a treasure sack, and then lying with Suki, or whatever her name was, and having Cumberland's lantern flashed on them. The Cumberlands had a house in Portland Place now, and she had lunched with them the other day and ventured a little joke with the old man about almshouses in the Sheen Road. He had winked. But here, as the lift could go no higher, she must get out. Heaven knows into what department, as they called it. She stood still to consult her shopping list, but was blessed if she could see, as the list bade her, bath salts or boys' boots anywhere about. And indeed, 
She was about to descend again without buying anything, but was saved from that outrage by saying aloud automatically the last item on her list, which happened to be sheets for a double bed. Sheets for a double bed, she said to a man at a counter, and, by a dispensation of providence, it was sheets that the man at that particular counter happened to sell. For Grimsditch, no, Grimsditch was dead. Bartholomew, no, Bartholomew was dead. Louise, then, Louise had come to her in a great taking the other day, for she had found a hole in the bottom of the sheet in the royal bed. Many kings and queens had slept there, Elizabeth, James, Charles, George, Victoria, Edward. No wonder the sheet had a hole in it. But Louise was positive she knew who had done it. It was the Prince Consort. Zilla Bosch, she said for there had been another war, this time against the Germans. "'Sheets for a double bed,' Orlando repeated dreamily. "'For a double bed with a silver counterpane in a room fitted in a taste, which she now thought perhaps a little vulgar, all in silver, but she had furnished it when she had a passion for that metal. While the man went to get sheets for a double bed, she took out a little looking-glass and a powder-puff. Women were not nearly as roundabout in their ways, she thought, powdering herself with the greatest unconcern, as they had been when she herself first turned woman and lay on the deck of the enamoured lady. She gave her nose the right tint, deliberately. She never touched her cheeks. Honestly, though she was now thirty-six, she scarcely looked a day older. She looked just as pouting, as sulky, as handsome, as rosy, like a million-candled Christmas tree, Sasha had said, as she had done that day on the ice, when the Thames was frozen and they had gone skating. "'The best Irish linen, ma'am,' said the shopman, spreading the sheets on the counter. And they had met an old woman picking up sticks. Here, as she was fingering the linen abstractedly, one of the swing doors between the departments opened and let through, perhaps from the fancy goods department, a whiff of scent, waxen, tinted as if from pink candles, and the scent curved like a shell round a figure. Was it a boy's or was it a girl's? Furred, pearled, in Russian trousers, young, slender, seductive, a girl, by God, but faithless, 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 cried Orlando. The man had gone, and all the shop seemed to pitch and toss with yellow water, and far off she saw the masts of the Russian ships standing out to sea, and then, miraculously, perhaps the door opened again, the conch which the scent had made became a platform, a dais, off which stepped a fat, furred woman, marvelously well-preserved, seductive, diademed, a grand duke's mistress, she who, leaning over the banks of the Volga, eating sandwiches, had watched men drown, and began walking down the shop toward her. "'Oh, Sasha!' Orlando cried. Really, she was shocked that she should have come to this. She had grown so fat, so lethargic, and she bowed her head over the linen, so that this apparition of a grey woman in fur— and a girl in Russian trousers with all these smells of wax candles, white flowers, and Russian sailors that it brought with it, might pass behind her back unseen. "'Any napkins, towels, dusters today, ma'am?' the shopman persisted. And it is enormously to the credit of the shopping list, which Orlando now consulted, that she was able to reply with every appearance of composure that there was only one thing in the world she wanted, and that was bath salts, which was in another department. But descending in the lift again, so insidious is the repetition of any scene, she was again sunk far beneath the present moment, and thought, when the lift bumped on the ground, that she heard a pot broken against a river bank. As for finding the right department, whatever it might be, 
She stood engrossed among the handbags, deaf to the suggestions of all the polite, black, combed, sprightly shop assistants, who, descending as they did equally, and some of them perhaps as proudly, even from such depths of the past as she did, chose to let down the impervious screen of the present, so that to-day they appeared shop assistants in Marshall and Snellgroves merely. Orlando stood there hesitating. Through the great glass doors she could see the traffic in Oxford Street. Omnibus seemed to pile itself upon omnibus and then to jerk itself apart. So the ice-blocks had pitched and tossed that day on the Thames. An old nobleman in furred slippers had sat astride one of them. There he went. She could see him now, calling down maledictions upon the Irish rebels. He had sunk there, where her car stood. Time has passed over me, she thought, trying to collect herself. This is the oncome of middle age. How strange it is! Nothing is any longer one thing. I take up a handbag, and I think of an old bumboat woman frozen in the ice. Someone lights a pink candle, and I see a girl in Russian trousers. When I step out of doors, as I do now, here she stepped onto the pavement of Oxford Street, what is it that I taste? Little herbs. I hear goat bells. I see mountains. Turkey? India? Persia? Her eyes filled with tears. That Orlando had gone a little too far from the present moment will perhaps strike the reader, who sees her now preparing to get into her motor car, with her eyes full of tears and visions of Persian mountains. And indeed it cannot be denied that the most successful practitioners of the art of life, often unknown people, by the way, somehow contrive to synchronize the sixty or seventy different times which beat simultaneously in every normal human system, so that when eleven strikes, all the rest chime in unison. And the present is neither a violent disruption, nor completely forgotten in the past. Of them we can justly say that they live precisely the sixty-eight or seventy-two years allotted them on the tombstone. Of the rest, some we know to be dead, though they walk among us. Some are not yet born, though they go through the forms of life. Others are hundreds of years old, though they call themselves thirty-six. The true length of a person's life, whatever the Dictionary of National Biography may say, is always a matter of dispute. Indeed, it is a difficult business, this time-keeping. Nothing more quickly disorders it than contact with any of the arts, and it may have been her love of poetry that was to blame, for making Orlando lose her shopping list and start home without the sardines, the bath salts, or the boots. Now as she stood with her hand on the door of her motor-car, the present again struck her on the head. Eleven times she was violently assaulted. "'Confound it all!' she cried, for it is a great shock to the nervous system, hearing a clock strike, so much so that for some time now there is nothing to be said of her save that she frowned slightly, changed her gears admirably, and cried out as before, "'Look where you're going! Don't you know your own mind?' Why didn't you say so, then? While the motor-car shot, swung, squeezed, and slid, for she was an expert driver, down Regent Street, down Haymarket, down Northumberland Avenue, over Westminster Bridge, to the left, straight on, to the right, straight on again. The old Kent Road was very crowded on Thursday, the 11th of October, 1928. People spilt off the pavement. There were women with shopping bags. Children ran out. There were sales at draper's shops. Streets widened and narrowed. Long vistas steadily shrunk together. Here was a market, here a funeral, here a procession with banners upon which was written in great letters, Ra Un. But what else? Meat was very red. Butchers stood at the door. Women almost had their heels sliced off. A Morvan, that was over a porch. 
A woman looked out of a bedroom window, profoundly contemplative and very still. Applejohn and Applebed under t Nothing could be seen whole or red from start to finish. What was seen begun, like two friends starting to meet each other across the street, was never seen ended. After twenty minutes the body and mind were like scraps of torn paper tumbling from a sack, and, indeed, the process of motoring fast out of London so much resembles the chopping up small of body and mind, which precedes unconsciousness and perhaps death itself, that it is an open question in what sense Orlando can be said to have existed at the present moment. Indeed, we should have given her over for a person entirely disassembled, were it not that here, at last, one green screen was held out on the right, against which the little bits of paper fell more slowly, and then another was held out on the left, so that one could see the separate scraps now turning over by themselves in the air, and then green screens were held continuously on either side, so that her mind regained the illusion of holding things within itself, and she saw a cottage, a farmyard, and four cows, all precisely life-size. When this happened, Orlando heaved a sigh of relief, lit a cigarette, and puffed for a minute or two in silence. Then she called hesitatingly, as if the person she wanted might not be there. Orlando? For if there are, at a venture, seventy-six different times all ticking in the mind at once, how many different people are there not, heaven help us, all having lodgment at one time or another in the human spirit? Some say two thousand and fifty-two so that it is the most usual thing in the world for a person to say, directly they are alone, Orlando, if that is one's name, meaning by that, Come, come, I'm sick to death of this particular self, I want another. Hence the astonishing changes we see in our friends. But it is not altogether plain sailing either, for though one may say, as Orlando said, being out in the country and needing another self, presumably, Orlando? Still the Orlando she needs may not come. These selves of which we are built up, one on top of another, as plates are piled on a waiter's hand, have attachments elsewhere, sympathies, little constitutions and rights of their own, call them what you will, and for many of these things there is no name so that one will only come if it is raining, another in a room with green curtains, another when Mrs. Jones is not there, another if you can promise it a glass of wine, and so on. For everybody can multiply from his own experience the different terms which his different selves have made with him, and some are too wildly ridiculous to be mentioned in print at all. So Orlando, at the turn by the barn, called, Orlando, with a note of interrogation in her voice, and waited. Orlando did not come. All right, then, Orlando said, with the good humor people practice on these occasions, and tried another, for she had a great variety of selves to call upon, far more than we have been able to find room for, since a biography is considered complete if it merely accounts for six or seven selves, whereas a person may well have as many thousand. Choosing, then, only those selves we have found room for, Orlando may now have called on the boy who cut the nigger's head down, the boy who strung it up again, the boy who sat on the hill, the boy who saw the poet, the boy who handed the queen the bowl of rose water. Or she may have called upon the young man who fell in love with Sasha, or upon the courtier, or upon the ambassador, or upon the soldier, or upon the traveller. Or she may have wanted the woman to come to her, the gypsy, the fine lady, the hermit, the girl in love with life, the patroness of letters, the woman who called Mar, meaning hot baths and evening fires, or Shelmerdine, meaning crocuses in autumn woods, or Bonthrop, 
meaning the death we die daily, or all three together, which meant more things than we have space to write out. All these selves were different, and she may have called upon any one of them. Perhaps. But what appeared certain, for we are now in the region of perhaps and appears, was that the one she needed most kept aloof, for she was to hear her talk, changing her selves as quickly as she drove. There was a new one at every corner. As happens when, for some unaccountable reason, the conscious self, which is the uppermost and has the power to desire, wishes to be nothing but one self. This is what some people call the true self, and it is, they say, compact of all the selves we have it in us to be, commanded and locked up by the captain's self, the key self, which amalgamates and controls them all. Orlando was currently seeking this self, as the reader can judge from overhearing her talk as she drove, and if it is rambling talk, disconnected, trivial, dull, and sometimes unintelligible, it is the reader's fault for listening to a lady talking to herself. We only copy her words as she spoke them adding in brackets which self, in our opinion, is speaking. But in this we may well be wrong. "'What, then? Who, then?' she said. Thirty-six, In a motor-car. A woman. Yes, but a million other things as well. A snob am I. The garter in the hall? The leopards? My ancestors? Proud of them? Yes. Greedy, luxurious, vicious.' Am I? Here a new self came in. Don't care a damn if I am. Truthful? I think so. Generous? Oh, but that don't count. Here a new self came in. Lying in bed of a morning on fine linen. Listening to the pigeons. Silver dishes. Wine. Maids. Footmen. Spoilt? Perhaps. Here another self came in. My books. Here she mentioned fifty classical titles, which represented, so we think, the early romantic works that she tore up. Facile, glib, romantic, but... Here another self came in. A duffer, a fumbler, more clumsy I couldn't be, and... and... Here she hesitated for a word, and if we suggest love, we may be wrong. But certainly she laughed and blushed, and then cried out, a toad set in emeralds, Harry the Archduke, blue bottles on the ceiling. Here another self came in. But Nell? Kit? Sasha? She was sunk in gloom. Tears actually shaped themselves, and she had long given over crying. Trees, she said. She was passing a clump. Here another self came in. I love trees. Trees growing there a thousand years, and barns, she passed a tumble-down barn at the edge of the road, and sheep-dogs. Here one came trotting across the road. She carefully avoided it. And the night. But people. Here another self came in. People? She repeated it as a question. Chattering, spiteful, always telling lies. Here she turned into the high street of her native town, which was crowded, for it was market day, with farmers and shepherds and old women with hens in baskets. Peasants I like. I understand crops, but... Here another self came skipping over the top of her mind, like the beam from a lighthouse. Fame, she laughed. Fame. Seven editions. A prize. Photographs in the evening papers. Here, she alluded to the oak tree and the Burdett Coutts Memorial Prize, which she had won, and we must here snatch time to remark how discomposing it is for her biographer that this culmination and peroration should be dashed from us on a laugh casually like this. But the truth is that when we write of a woman, everything is out of place, culminations and perorations. The accent never falls where it does with a man. Fame, she repeated. A poet, a charlatan, 
both every morning as regularly as the post comes in. To dine, to meet, to meet, to dine, fame, fame. She had here to slow down to pass through the crowd of market people, but no one noticed her. A porpoise in a fishmonger's shop attracted far more attention than a lady who had won a prize and might, had she chosen, have worn three coronets, one on top of another, on her brow. Driving very slowly, she now hummed as if it were part of an old song. With my guineas I'll buy flowering trees, flowering trees, flowering trees, and walk among my flowering trees, and tell my sons what fame is. So she hummed, and now all her words began to sag here and there. Another self came in, like a barbaric necklace of heavy beads. And walk among my flowering trees, she sang, and see the moon rise slow. The wagons go. Here she stopped short, and looked ahead of her intently at the bonnet of the car in profound meditation. He sat at Twitchett's table, she mused, with a dirty ruff on. Was it old Mr. Baker come to measure the timber? Or was it sh <sighs> For when we speak names we deeply reverence to ourselves— we never speak them whole. She gazed for ten minutes ahead of her, letting the car come almost to a standstill. Haunted, she cried, suddenly pressing the accelerator. Haunted, ever since I was a child. There flies the wild goose. It flies past the window out to sea. Up I jumped, she gripped the steering wheel tighter and stretched after it, but the goose flies too fast. I've seen it here, there, there, England, Persia, Italy. Always it flies fast out to sea, and always I fling after it words like nets. Here she flung her hand out, which shrivel as I've seen nets shrivel drawn on deck with only seaweed in them. And sometimes there's an inch of silver, Six words in the bottom of the net, but never the great fish who lives in the coral groves. Here she bent her head, pondering deeply. And it was at this moment, when she had ceased to call Orlando, and was deep in thoughts of something else, that the Orlando whom she had called came of its own accord, as was proved by the change that now came over her as she passed through the lodge gates into the park. The whole of her darkened and settled as when some foil, whose addition makes the round and solidity of a surface, is added to it, and the shallow becomes deep, and the near distant, and all is contained as water is contained by the sides of a well. So she was now darkened, stilled, and become, with the addition of this Orlando, what is called, rightly or wrongly, a single self, a real self. And she fell silent. For it is probable that when people talk aloud, the selves, of which there may be more than two thousand, are conscious of disseverment, and are trying to communicate. But when communication is established, there is nothing more to be said. Masterfully, swiftly, she drove up the curving drive between the elms and oaks through the falling turf of the park whose fall was so gentle that had it been water, it would have spread the beach with a smooth green tide. Planted here and in solemn groups were beech trees and oak trees. The deer stepped among them, one white as snow, another with its head on one side for some wire netting had caught in its horns. All this, the trees, deer, and turf, she observed with the greatest satisfaction, as if her mind had become a fluid that flowed round things and enclosed them completely. Next minute she drew up in the courtyard where, for so many hundred years she had come, on horseback, or in coach and six, with men riding before or coming after, where plumes had tossed, 
torches flashed, and the same flowering trees that let their leaves drop now had shaken their blossoms. Now she was alone. The autumn leaves were falling. The porter opened the great gates. "'Morning, James,' she said. "'There's some things in the car. Will you bring them in?' Words of no beauty, interest, or significance in themselves, it will be conceded, but now so plumped out with meaning that they fell like ripe nuts from a tree, and proved that when the shriveled skin of the ordinary is stuffed out with meaning, it satisfies the senses amazingly. This was true indeed of every movement and action now, usual though they were, so that to see Orlando change her skirt for a pair of whipcord breeches and leather jacket, which she did in less than three minutes, was to be ravished with the beauty of movement, as if Madame Lopakova were using her highest art. Then she strode into the dining-room, where her old friends Dryden, Pope, Swift, Addison, regarded her demurely at first, as who should say, here's the prize-winner. But when they reflected that two hundred guineas was in question, they nodded their heads approvingly. Two hundred guineas, they seemed to say. Two hundred guineas are not to be sniffed at. She cut herself a slice of bread and ham, clapped the two together, and began to eat, striding up and down the room, thus shedding her company habits in a second without thinking. After five or six such turns, she tossed off a glass of red Spanish wine, and, filling another which she carried in her hand, strode down the long corridor, and through a dozen drawing-rooms, and so began a perambulation of the house, attended by such elk-hounds and spaniels as chose to follow her. This, too, was all in the day's routine. As soon would she come home and leave her own grandmother without a kiss, as come back and leave the house unvisited. She fancied that the rooms brightened as she came in, stirred, opened their eyes as if they had been dozing in her absence. She fancied, too, that hundreds and thousands of times as she had seen them, they never looked the same twice as if so long a life as theirs had been, had stored in them a myriad moods which changed with winter and summer, bright weather and dark, and her own fortunes and the people's characters who visited them. Polite, they always were to strangers, but a little weary. With her they were entirely open and at their ease. Why not, indeed? They had known each other close on four centuries now. They had nothing to conceal. She knew their sorrows and joys. She knew what age each part of them was and its little secrets. A hidden drawer, a concealed cupboard, or some deficiency, perhaps, such as a part made up or added later. They, too, knew her in all her moods and changes. She had hidden nothing from them, had come to them as a child, as man, crying and dancing, brooding and gay. In this window-seat she had written her first verses. In that chapel she had been married. And she would be buried here, she reflected, kneeling on the window-sill in the long gallery and sipping her Spanish wine. Though she could hardly fancy it, the body of the heraldic leopard would be making yellow pools on the floor the day they lowered her to lie among her ancestors. She, who believed in no immortality, could not help feeling that her soul would come and go forever with the reds on the panels and the greens on the sofa. For the room, she had strolled into the ambassador's bedroom, shone like a shell that has lain at the bottom of the sea for centuries, and has been crusted over and painted a million tints by the water. It was rose and yellow, green and sand-colored. It was frail as a shell, as iridescent and as empty. No ambassador would ever sleep there again. Ah, but she knew where the heart of the house still beat. Gently opening a door, 
she stood on the threshold so that, as she fancied, the room could not see her, and watched the tapestry rising and falling on the eternal faint breeze which never failed to move it. Still the hunter rode, still Daphne flew. The heart still beat, she thought, however faint, however far withdrawn, the frail, indomitable heart of the immense building. Now, calling her troop of dogs to her, she passed down the gallery whose floor was laid with oak trees sawn across. Rows of chairs with all their velvets faded stood ranged against the wall, holding their arms out for Elizabeth, for James, for Shakespeare it might be, for Cecil who never came. The sight made her gloomy. She unhooked the rope that fenced them off. She sat on the queen's chair. She opened a manuscript book lying on Lady Betty's table. She stirred her fingers in the aged rose leaves. She brushed her short hair with King James's silver brushes. She bounced up and down upon his bed, but no king would ever sleep there again for all Louise's new sheets and pressed her cheek against the worn silver counterpane that lay upon it. But everywhere were little lavender bags to keep the moth out, and printed notices, Please do not touch, which, though she had put them there herself, seemed to rebuke her. The house was no longer hers entirely, she sighed. It belonged to time now, to history, was past the touch and control of the living, Never would beer be spilt here any more, she thought. She was in the bedroom that had been old Nick Green's, or holes burnt in the carpet. Never two hundred servants come running and brawling down the corridors, with warming pans and great branches for the great fireplaces. Never would ale be brewed and candles made and saddles fashioned and stones shaped in the workshops outside the house. Hammers and mallets were silent now. Chairs and beds were empty. Tankards of silver and gold were locked in glass cases. The great wings of silence beat up and down the empty house. So she sat at the end of the gallery with her dogs couched round her, in Queen Elizabeth's hard armchair. The gallery stretched far away to a point where the light almost failed. It was as a tunnel bored deep into the past. As her eyes peered down it, she could see people laughing and talking. The great men she had known, Dryden, Swift, and Pope, and statesmen in colloquy, and lovers dallying in the window seats, and people eating and drinking at the long tables, and the wood smoke curling round their heads and making them sneeze and cough. Still further down, she saw sets of splendid dancers form for the quadrille. A fluty, frail, but nevertheless stately music began to play. An organ boomed. A coffin was borne into the chapel. A marriage procession came out of it. Armed men with helmets left for the wars. They brought banners back from Flodden and Poitiers and stuck them on the wall. The long gallery filled itself thus, and still peering further, she thought she could make out at the very end, beyond the Elizabethans and the Tudors, someone older, further, darker, a cowled figure, monastic, severe, a monk who went with his hands clasped, and a book in them, murmuring. Like thunder, the stable clock struck four. Never did any earthquake so demolish a whole town. The gallery and all its occupants fell to powder. Her own face, that had been dark and somber as she gazed, was lit as by an explosion of gunpowder. In this same light, Everything near her showed with extreme distinctness. She saw two flies circling round, and noticed the blue sheen on their bodies. She saw a knot in the wood where her foot was, 
and her dog's ear twitching. At the same time she heard a bough creaking in the garden, a sheep coughing in the park, a swift screaming past the window. Her own body quivered and tingled as if suddenly stood naked in a hard frost. Yet she kept, as she had not done when the clock struck ten in London, complete composure, for she was now one and entire, and presented, it may be, a larger surface to the shock of time. She rose, but without precipitation, called her dogs, and went firmly, but with great alertness of movement, down the staircase and out into the garden. Here the shadows of the plants were miraculously distinct. She noticed the separate grains of earth in the flower beds, as if she had a microscope stuck to her eye. She saw the intricacy of the twigs of every tree. Each blade of grass was distinct and the markings of veins and petals. She saw Stubbs, the gardener, coming along the path, and every button on his gaiters. She saw Betty and Prince, the cart horses, and never had she marked so clearly the white star on Betty's forehead and the three long hairs that fell down below the rest on Prince's tail. Out in the quadrangle the old grey walls of the house looked like a scraped new photograph. She heard the loudspeaker condensing on the terrace a dance tune that people were listening to in the Red Velvet Opera House at Vienna. Braced and strung up by the present moment, she was also strangely afraid, as if every time the gulf of time gaped and let a second through, some unknown danger might come with it. The tension was too relentless and too rigorous to be endured long without discomfort. She walked more briskly than she liked, as if her legs were moved for her through the garden and out into the park. Here she forced herself by a great effort to stop by the carpenter's shop and to stand stock still watching Joe Stubbs fashion a cart wheel. She was standing with her eye fixed on his hand, when the quarter struck. It hurtled through her like a meteor, so hot that no fingers can hold it. She saw with disgusting vividness that the thumb on Joe's right hand was without a fingernail, and there was a raised saucer of pink flesh where the nail should have been. The sight was so repulsive that she felt faint for a moment, but in that moment's darkness, when her eyelids flickered, she was relieved of the pressure of the present. There was something strange in the shadow that the flicker of her eyes cast, something which, as any one can test for himself by looking now at the sky, is always absent from the present, whence its terror, its nondescript character, something one trembles to pin through the body with a name and call beauty for it has no body, is as a shadow and without substance or quality of its own, yet has the power to change whatever it adds itself to. This shadow now, while she flickered her eye in her faintness in the carpenter's shop, stole out, and, attaching itself to the innumerable sights she had been receiving, composed them into something tolerable, comprehensible. Yes, she thought, heaving a deep sigh of relief, as she turned from the carpenter's shop to climb the hill. I can begin to live again. I am by the serpentine, she thought. The little boat is climbing through the white arch of a thousand depths. I am about to understand. Those were her words, spoken quite distinctly but we cannot conceal the fact that she was now a very indifferent witness to the truth of what was before her, and might easily have mistaken a sheep for a cow, or an old man called Smith for one who was called Jones and was no relation of his whatever. For the shadow of faintness which the thumb without a nail had cast had deepened now at the back of her brain, which is the part furthest from sight, into a pool where things dwell in darkness so deep 
that what they are we scarcely know. She now looked down into this pool or sea in which everything is reflected, and, indeed, some say that all our most violent passions, and art, and religion, are the reflections which we see in the dark hollow at the back of the head when the visible world is obscured for the time. She looked there now, long, deeply, profoundly, and immediately the ferny path up the hill along which she was walking became not entirely a path but partly the serpentine. The hawthorn bushes were partly ladies and gentlemen sitting with card cases and gold-mounted canes. The sheep were partly tall Mayfair houses. Everything was partly something else, and each gained an odd, moving power from this union of itself and something not itself, so that with this mixture of truth and falsehood her mind became like a forest in which things moved. Lights and shadows changed, and one thing became another. Except when Canute, the elk hound, chased a rabbit, and so reminded her that it must be about half past four, it was indeed twenty three minutes to six, she forgot the time. The ferny path led, with many turns and windings, higher and higher to the oak tree which stood on the top. The tree had grown bigger, sturdier, and more knotted since she had known it, somewhere about the year 1588, but it was still in the prime of life. The little sharply frilled leaves were still fluttering thickly on its branches. Flinging herself on the ground, she felt the bones of the tree running out like ribs from a spine this way and that beneath her. She liked to think that she was riding the back of the world. She liked to attach herself to something hard. As she flung herself down, a little square book bound in red cloth fell from the breast of her leather jacket, her poem, The Oak Tree. I should have brought a trowel, she reflected. The earth was so shallow over the roots that it seemed doubtful if she could do as she meant and bury the book here. Besides, the dogs would dig it up. No luck ever attends these symbolical celebrations, she thought. Perhaps it would be as well, then, to do without them. She had a little speech on the tip of her tongue, which she meant to speak over the book as she buried it. It was a copy of the first edition, signed by author and artist. I bury this as a tribute, she was going to have said, a return to the land of what the land has given me. But, Lord, once one began mouthing words aloud, how silly they sounded. She was reminded of old Green getting upon a platform the other day, comparing her with Milton, save for his blindness, and handing her a check for two hundred guineas. She had thought then of the oak tree here on its hill. And what has that got to do with this, she had wondered, what has praise and fame to do with poetry? What has seven editions, the book had already gone into no less, got to do with the value of it? Was not writing poetry a secret transaction, a voice answering a voice? So that all this chatter and praise and blame and meeting people who admired one and meeting people who did not admire one was as ill-suited as could be to the thing itself. A voice answering a voice. What could have been more secret, she thought, more slow, and like the intercourse of lovers, than the stammering answer she had made all these years to the old crooning song of the woods, and the farms, and the brown horses standing at the gate neck to neck, and the smithy, and the kitchen, and the fields, so laboriously bearing wheat, turnips, grass, and the gardens blowing irises and fritillaries. So she let her book lie unburied and disheveled on the ground, and watched the vast view, varied like an ocean floor this evening with the sun lightening it, and the shadows darkening it. There was a village with a church tower among elm trees, a grey-domed manor house in a park, a spark of light burning on some glass house, a farmyard with yellow corn stacks. 
The fields were marked with black tree clumps, and beyond the fields stretched long woodlands, and there was the gleam of a river, and then hills again. In the far distance Snowdon's crags broke white among the clouds. She saw the far Scottish hills and the wild tides that swirl about the Hebrides. She listened for the sound of gun firing out at sea. No, only the wind blew. There was no war today. Drake had gone. Nelson had gone. And that, she thought, letting her eyes, which had been looking at these far distances, drop once more to the land beneath her. Was my land once. That castle between the downs was mine. And all that moor running almost to the sea was mine. Here the landscape, it must have been some trick of a fading light, shook itself, heaped itself, let all this encumbrance of houses, castles, and woods slide off its tent-shaped sides. The bare mountains of Turkey were before her. It was blazing noon. She looked straight at the baked hillside. Goats cropped the sandy tufts at her feet. An eagle soared above her. The raucous voice of old Rustum, the gypsy, croaked in her ears. What is your antiquity and your race and your possessions compared with this? What do you need with four hundred bedrooms and silver lids on all the dishes and housemaids dusting? At this moment, some church clock chimed in the valley. The tent-like landscape collapsed and fell. The present showered down upon her head once more, but now that the light was fading, gentlier than before, calling into view nothing detailed, nothing small, but only misty fields, lamps in cottage windows, the slumbering bulk of a wood, and a fan-shaped light pushing the darkness before it along some lane. Whether it had struck nine, ten, or eleven, she could not say. Night had come. Night that she loved of all times, night in which the reflections in the dark pool of the mind shine more clearly than by day. It was not necessary to faint now in order to look deep into the darkness, where things shape themselves, and to see in the pool of the mind now Shakespeare, now a girl in Russian trousers, now a toy boat on the serpentine, and then the Atlantic itself where its storms in great waves passed Cape Horn. There was her husband's brig, rising to the top of the wave. Up it went, and up, and up. The white arch of a thousand deaths rose before it. O oh, rash, O oh, ridiculous man, always sailing so uselessly round Cape Horn in the teeth of a gale. But the brig was through the arch and out on the other side. It was safe at last. Ecstasy, she cried, ecstasy, and then the wind sank, the waters grew calm, and she saw the waves rippling peacefully in the moonlight. Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmerdine, she cried, standing by the oak tree. The beautiful, glittering name fell out of the sky like a steel-blue feather. She watched it fall turning and twisting like a slow, falling arrow that cleaves the deep air beautifully. He was coming, as he always came, in moments of dead calm, when the wave rippled and the spotted leaves fell slowly over her foot in the autumn woods, when the leopard was still, the moon was on the waters, and nothing moved between sky and sea. It was then that he came. All was still now. It was near midnight. The moon rose slowly over the weald. Its light raised a phantom castle upon earth. There stood the great house with all its windows robed in silver. Of wall or substance there was none. All was phantom. All was still. All was lit as for the coming of a dead queen. Gazing below her, 
Orlando saw dark plumes tossing in the courtyard, and torches flickering and shadows kneeling. A queen once more stepped from her chariot. "'The house is at your service, ma'am,' she cried, curtsying deeply. "'Nothing has been changed. The dead lord, my father, shall lead you in.' Immediately the first stroke of midnight sounded. The cold breeze of the present brushed her face with its little breath of fear. She looked anxiously into the sky. It was dark with clouds now. The wind roared in her ears. But in the roar of the wind, she heard the roar of an aeroplane coming nearer and nearer. Here! Shell, here! she cried, bearing her breast to the moon, which now showed bright, so that her pearls glowed like the eggs of some vast moon spider. The aeroplane rushed out of the clouds and stood over her head. It hovered above her. Her pearls burnt like a phosphorescent flare in the darkness. And as Shelmerdine, now grown a fine sea captain, hale, fresh-colored and alert, leapt to the ground, there sprang up over his head a single wild bird. "'It is the goose!' Orlando cried. "'The wild goose!' And the twelfth stroke of midnight sounded. The twelfth stroke of midnight, Thursday, the 11th of October, 1928. End of section 11. Read by Nicole J. LaBeouf, Boulder, Colorado, USA, April 1st, 2024. End of Orlando, A Biography by Virginia Woolf